All right, so uh, we have our coffee break. Uh, a little bit longer than we, we planned, but it's okay. That it's is. better to be awake no. and fresh. Uh, so, uh, Professor Rosengart talked about this morning. Our program for today and tomorrow is to talk about taxes, but from a local revenue perspective. So, in the first session, we talked about the income taxes. So, in this session, we will cover consumption taxes. As the name suggests, right, consumption taxes are fundamentally taxes imposed on the consumption of goods and services. And the most typical forms of consumption taxes are value added tax and sales or retail sales tax. Also, there, there are excise taxes or taxes on specific goods and that is the topic for the afternoon. But an, also an important type of consumption taxes, especially in many developing countries, is trade taxes. Taxes on imports and sometimes exports. But when we talk about the revenue assignment yesterday, trade taxes are national in nature, right? So in all of the countries that have trade taxes, they are collected by the national government instead of subnational government. So, it, so we will not cover trade taxes. So let's, before we we go into the feasibility for subnational governments to implement a local consumption tax, or if not, have some sharing mechanism of consumption tax. Let's have all a basic understanding about the value added tax and retail sales tax and the difference between them. So at the technical level, of course, is rather complicated, but I just use this simple diagram to explain the, the difference. So for the retail sales tax, as the name suggests, right, is the tax is imposed only at the final stage where a business, in here is a retailer, sells the final good or service to a final consumer. And the tax is imposed on the total value of the transaction. So with a retail sales tax, if a transaction is between a business and a business, then you don't have to pay. Only in the retail stage, right? when selling to the final consumer, that if it's a 10% tax rate, on a transaction of $200, then the tax is $20. So, but as you know, right, except for a few number of countries, and actually all the United States, that still maintain the retail sales tax, most countries, developed and developing countries, have moved to a tax called value added tax or VAT. So as the name suggests it, value added, meaning that the tax, first of all, is imposed not on the total value of the transaction, but only on the value added, meaning the difference between the value of the output and the value of the intermediate inputs, except the cost of labor. And the tax VAT is imposed on each and every stage of commercial transactions. So if you look at this simple example, right? So a producer or manufacturer selling to a, re, re, selling to a wholesaler with value of $50, right? Then the tax is imposed, right? 
but only on the difference between the output and the input. In this case, we assume that the manufacturer cannot claim any le legitimate cost on inputs. So he pays $5 on the total value of $50. So at the next stage, when the wholesaler sells the product to a retailer in a transaction of $120, he pays the tax of $7. Why? Because the tax is imposed on the value added, right? The difference between the output value of 120 and the value of input, which is 50. So the 10% of the value added, and in the final stage, when the retailer sells to the final consumer, the tax is assessed at $8. Again, the difference between the output value of $200 that the final, so the final consumer pays to the re retailer and the input cost to the retailer of 120 So the difference of $80. So the retail sales tax, right? So they say the first difference is, is only at the retail stage, right? when the final consumer purchase goods and services, then the retail sales tax is assessed. Why the VAT is assessed at each and every stage of any commercial transactions. The second difference is the retail sales tax is imposed on the total value of the transaction, while VAT is only on the value added. Difference between output value and intermediate input values. But if you look at the total tax revenue of the two taxes, then strictly, theoretically, right, if you follow these principles of the two taxes, the total amount of tax revenue is the same. It's the same in theory. If, first of all, for the retail sales tax, you only tax at the final stage and on the full value. And for the VAT, you tax at every stage and only at the value added. Then it's the same. So a lot of people see because the retail sales tax is attractive and you stick to it because you only have to tax at the final stage. Business to business, you don't need to tax, right? And it's simple, right? It's a total value. You have 10% or 5% or 8%, you apply on the total. But the risk is that you, your revenue only depends on this, the last stage. If you miss it, you miss a lot, right? And also, Sometimes, even transactions between businesses are still taxed. Like if you re represent your company and you go and buy something, then you still have to pay taxes. Right? Even though, according to the law, you don't have to pay, but it's still treated as final sales. Right? So it's a business expense. You go and you stay in this hotel. So if it's, you are a final consumer, you, don't have, you have to pay sales tax. But as a company doing business, right, your employees stay in the hotel, then basically actually you don't have to pay, but you still have to pay. Right? Sometimes you purchase goods from another company, but in the retail market, then you still have to pay the sales. So because of the possibility of missing and tax evasion when you have the sales tax. And also because maybe you will have cascading effects, like we heard that the term in the previous lecture. Right? So even though you are not supposed to pay, you still have to pay. Only 
in many stages of the economic transactions, people still have to pay. So that's cascading. But moving to a VAT is also very challenging because now you have to impose VAT on every transaction, every stage of production, and you have to tax only the value added. So it's good that theoretically the VAT is free from the effect of cascading. Right? If you can do proper estimation right, and actually implementation of the tax, but the administrative burden of implementing the VAT. So to lessen the administrative cost right, and compliance cost, countries normally use what is the, called the method of deduction when implementing VAT. What it means is that you still pay your VAT tax on the full value of the transaction, but you can deduct the VAT you already paid on your intermediate inputs. So for example, you actually you don't, the, the tax authorities don't collect taxes on the value added, right? So here, you still have to pay 10% on the total output of 120. But the deduction method works in that, after that, you can claim back the tax you paid when you bought the inputs. So when you bought the $50, you paid a tax of five, 10%. So you can claim back five. So you pay, it's called the output VAT, 10% of 120, which is 12, and you get a VAT credit. You claim back the credit, or you deduct five. So theoretically, you still get, have to pay only seven. So if you look at this picture, right? So you do the deduction method or tax credit for VAT. Then in order to claim your input VAT, you have to show proper documentation. And that created two effects. The first effect, which is a positive effect, is that you only can claim back your VAT on inputs if you have invoices. So, if you evade taxes, then you cannot claim, claim back. So, so the problem with tax evasion, right, in many countries, especially developing countries like Myanmar, Vietnam, China, or Indonesia, if you have a sales tax, right, then you say, okay, if it's a sales tax, if I want the invoice on the sales tax, I have to pay the tax. So instead of paying 200, now I have to pay 220. So I say, okay, I don't need the invoice, <laughs> right, only 200. But now is for a company like for the wholesaler buying from the producer, right, $50. So the producer may say, okay, let's, let's don't declare it. Let's don't pay taxes. But the, re the wholesaler will say, I want the invoice. You have to give me the invoice so that later on I can claim it back. That's so enough. because of the incentive to claim back VAT, people starting demanding invoices and starting register for the VAT and pay taxes. But also because of that, you have a second effect, which I call negative effect, is that people will have an incentive also to make fake invoices, to claim back VATs that they actually do not pay, <laughs> to issue VAT invoices for other companies to say that, okay, I already buy this product, I already paid these taxes, now I want to claim back. So that's why, like, even if you have the deduction method and the tax info, it could still create a lot of challenge for you to administer VAT properly. Another issue of 
moving to a VAT system is the concern that because the VAT is the tax on consumption, right, and is rather comprehensive, is tax both on goods and services, even though it's, it's taxed at every stage of production, but like the retail sales tax, actually it is the final consumers who eventually have to bear the paying the, the, the taxes. So there's a concern that the tax will put burden, I mean like, on the cons especially poor people. So, uh, so it's like we heard from the previous session is the tax VAT can be regressive in nature. But so to make it politically feasible to move toward a VAT, often the legislation will allow the VAT to have multiple rates and a lot of exemptions. So like products, agricultural products produced by farmers, right, or households in rural areas. First of all, they are considered poor, sometimes politically, or sometimes they're actually very poor. And the second is that they also don't have any accounting system to have proper documentation. So a lot of VAT laws, especially in developing countries, exempt farm products from paying VAT. So like for this producer, right? For this producer to sell his product to the wholesaler, maybe his inputs are farm products that the producer buys from farmers. But because farm products are exempt from VAT, so there's no VAT input that the producer has to pay. So that's why here is zero. So, the so for goods, usually agricultural farm products are exempt from VAT. For services, right? So they consider like health services, education services that are essential and make sure that they are affordable to the population at large. So sometimes tuition fees, hospital fees are also exempt. So, so it's very important, not public finance, but for the whole economy and making sure that you have a enabling business environment, supporting enterprises, especially private companies, is that you make sure that the process of invoicing and claiming back input VATs are less burdensome to the taxpayers. But I will come back to that when I talk more about the experience in Vietnam when Vietnam implemented the VAT. But before we move on, this is a new slide that I edit. It's not in your... Because yesterday we have a wonderful presentation about taxation in Myanmar from the Deputy Director General of IRD. So, I mean, we, now, we, we know that in Myanmar, a very important tax is commercial tax. Okay. And most goods and some services are subject to a 5% commercial tax. So since we, cover, we just cover the retail sales tax and the VAT, so I have two questions for you. How is the Myanmar's commercial tax different or even similar so, to a retail sales tax or VAT? Is it a VAT or commercial? Or is a, as I understand, the commercial tax in Myanmar, first of all, a lot of services are excluded. And there are mechanisms for you to claim back the taxes on inputs. But in practice, it's almost very difficult or impossible to claim back. So, actually, it looks a lot like what is called a turnover tax. A tax on the total value or revenue of the transactions 
and add each and every anybody. And this is what Vietnam had before 1999. But the turnover tax is the biggest problem with the turnover tax is the tax cascading effect because you have to pay but the total the tax on total value of the transactions at all stages so vietnam promulgated the vat law in 1997 which became effective and vat was implemented replacing the turnover tax in 1999 so in, in 1996, when the VAT law was drafted, I worked as a translator, translating the VAT between English and Vietnamese, back and forth. So the, the first concern, very similar to Myanmar, is can the tax authority implement this complicated tax system? And second, the rate structure, how many rates should the VAT system has? So remember, so like Myanmar today is already like a middle income country. So back in 1997, actually Vietnam was still like one of the poorest <laughs> countries in the world, like low income countries. And there was a lot of reservations within the Ministry of Finance about the capacity of the tax authority. But the problem with the turnover tax was that there was a lot of tax evasion. And the, the turnover tax didn't account, was not the biggest tax. So back then, the most important revenue source for the government was revenue from crude oil export. So, but the trend was that the revenue from oil would be declining. So the government knew that they were looking at VAT as the potential source of revenue to replace revenue from natural resources. So even though the capacity of the tax authorities the General Department of Taxation was very weak. The government decided to implement VAT. So <laughs> any to make sure that so, so both with the VAT, they, they, they anticipated problems, challenges, but they decided to do it. So they, what they focus on is the invoice system. Right. So basically, in Vietnam now, it's become the famous, we call it, red invoices. Right. So everybody, when you buy something, in order to claim back the tax, you have to show like a proper red invoice. That only a few number of registered printing companies can print the invoices. Even though the tax base of the old turnover tax is different from the tax base of the new VAT tax, but they, the tax authorities decided to transition from the two system gradually. So initially in 1999, they still depending a lot of registrations of companies and businesses with the old tax system. The second important issue is the tax rate structure of the VAT. So I still remember one of the first versions of the draft law that I translated. <laughs> there was basically multiple rates in the system. So there's a maximum rate aimed at Consider like goods and services that are considered 
luxurious items consumed by well-off people, so at 10%. And then for essential goods, consider essential, right? Like goods and services, like water supply, right? textbooks, medical supplies, 5%. And then you have the exemption that I mentioned earlier for farm products, for education, and healthcare services. And then 0% for exports. 0% too. So this difference between exemption and 0% for VAT. So 0% for exports. So products, goods and services that are exported have 0%. This are, in the VAT, there's a difference between tax exemption and 0% VAT. It's similar as that 0% and exemption, you don't have to pay VAT on your output. So like, but for tax VAT exemption, you cannot claim back the VATs you already paid on your input. But for 0% VAT, you don't pay taxes on output, you still can claim back the VAT you already paid on your inputs. So in 1996, I translated that first version into English and gave it to our faculty at the Fulbright School. And we, we say that it's almost very difficult to implement the proposed VAT with so many rates, especially 5%, 7%, and 10%. So we, we went to talk to the Ministry of Finance and convince them to abolish the 7%. So we, actually, so we, we went to the, so let's, let's rephrase it. We went to the Ministry of Finance and say that, let's have only a common rate of 10%. 10% exemption for farm products, education and healthcare, 0% for export. No 5%, no 7% rates. So from, from the government, right, because they are worried about the regressive nature of the tax, worry about equity, concern, so they want many different tax rates for different categories of goods and services. So, so yeah, but then that. it has a burden on administration. So in the end, when they approved the final version in 1997, they maintained, so most goods and services are subject to 10%. So they get rid of the 7% VAT rate. So move them to 10%. So they still maintain the 5% rate applied on a few number of essential goods and services. So the law was passed in 97, but allowed for two years for the Ministry of Finance and the tax authority to implement, to build up capacity. So it, it was passed in 97, but only became effective in 1999, so two years. So, so two things happened when they implemented in 1999. First is, so people were against it because suddenly it became visible on the invoices, right? So you have to show, right, you buy something. So previously with the turnover tax, you don't see it. Now with the VAT, every time you see, okay, 10%, at 10%, 10%, right? So a lot of people try to avoid paying the taxes. So no, I don't need the VAT invoice, no VAT. And cheating happened right away. Like people created fake companies to sell fake invoices. It's a huge business. Like <laughs> happened like the moment you have the VAT it came up. So, like, so if you are a garment company, right? So in in the garment uh, company, right? you have to buy a lot of materials. But the main materials 
you cannot cheat. But together with the main materials, you also have a lot of other supplies. Right? So the main material is textile that you have to import. But for textile import, you have to pay taxes. But like other uh, supplies like uh, chemical, right? even office supplies like uh, paper, printing materials. So you don't need to use uh, a lot. But you can claim that you can actually purchase a lot of these supplies. Right? So you created a company to sell you supplies, but that actually do not exist. You use like 10 boxes of paper. You claim that you use 100 boxes of paper. So there's, so, so people set up like a company selling you, so actually selling you, we call fake paper. There's no paper. But in the accounting, you have 100 boxes of paper every month. And so they, but in order to do that, you have to create a company and you issue invoice. So I think, so as, so this, so one thing, I think it's different from, from the, so right now you, you don't have the system of claiming back taxes because it's not an actual VAT yet. So I think the risk is just, can you, peop, do people actually, so like it's, it's still a turnover tax. So if I buy a phone for my company, right, can I claim it back? Or can I declare it as a legitimate expense? If I don't need, then I don't need the stamp. And if you don't need the stamp, then you don't have to pay your commercial tax on the mobile phone. Or in Vietnam, like in case of Vietnam, when people create fake companies, right? So they issue, so the, the invoices are actually legal. But they actually did not pay the VAT. So they exist for a year, selling the invoices to companies. And then they are gone. Right? So they disappear. So they, so they like in your case, like, they still set up a, a business. So they apply for the tax stamps. And they just put the, the tax, the stamp on. <laughs> like any companies that want the stamp, okay, you can get the stamp. But in a year, they are gone. <laughs> you go back and see oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Like so, they, so it's just like a shell company. Right? They set up nobody. But they, they have proper registration. They apply for the tax code. They apply for the invoices. They sell the invoices. And then disappear. So, I guess uh, uh, we are running out of time, but uh, since I think this is, I guess it's important because you are in the process of moving to VAT. So, what, but even with that problem, revenue from VAT increased immediately. So, even if you have evasion, people don't pay taxes, even if you have cheating. But the incentive of securing invoice to claim back the VAT on inputs make a lot of businesses and even people to ask for invoices. So in a 20-year period from 1999 to 2018, revenue from VAT in Vietnam increased by 7.9% annually. After deducting the impact of inflation, so at constant prices, 7.9% a year. So GDP was growing at 7% a year. So the average GDP growth rate between 99 and 2018, 20 years, is 7% a year. But tax revenue from VAT is 7.9%. So VAT as a, is now the most important tax revenue. So it, uh, in 2000, it accounted for 25% of tax revenue. Now it's 35%, the buoyancy ratio.
His revenue is growing faster than GDP. So now, the latest uh, proposal from the Ministry of Finance in Vietnam is to raise the main VAT rate from 10% to 12%. But the public is, and the businesses are totally against it. They say, we already collect too much. And the second thing that helps is the, what we call the application of electronic invoices and using the tax identification code. So it's a harmonized system of tax identification. So everybody you have, a, businesses have the tax code and you can do electronic invoices. So in the past you have to print invoice, now you have the option. You still use paper invoice but also electronic invoice, both. You can, if you want, you can have an electronic invoice. So it reduces the cost and the time for tax administration and also significant lessen the time for you to claim back taxes. Right? And also you verify so it close the loopholes for fake invoices. So, so the moment you issue an electric invoice, the tax authority can, can check. You can still have your electronic invoice. So you stay in a hotel, when you check out, you pay cash, and you give the hotel your email. So the hotel will immediately send you uh, the, a link. No, not, not the invoice, but a link with a password. So you can click on the link, enter your password, and download the electronic invoice. Because it's the hotel, the moment you make the transaction, the hotel register is with the tax authority. And the tax authority asks a uh, third-party IT company to maintain a platform for electronic invoices. So, so, but also because, that's why I'm saying, I mean, there's a lot of challenges with the VAT, but because of the incentive to claim back the VAT, so people start paying taxes. So it becomes important tax. But because it's so important, that the central government wants to keep it, don't want to share it <laughs> with local subnational governments. So that's why, I mean, you look around the world, right? VATs are usually national, not local. Right? So the central government, the Internal Revenue Department, collects the VAT, and 100% of the revenue goes to the central government budget. Right? Because they're reluctant, right? You, you, you don't want to share it, it's important. Also, secondly, because like yesterday, we also, or the first day, we talk about some taxes that you want the central government to control because they can be used as instruments for macroeconomic policy. So, like in, for example, China. China has a VAT rate of 17%. So this year, because of the economic slowdown in China and the trade war with the U.S., China decided to lower the VAT to stimulate economic growth. But also at the technical and administrative levels, local governments right, implementing different VATs can create a lot of complications and chaos in the system, as the experience of Brazil has shown. Brazil was actually the first country to implement VAT back in 1967. So but they decided that each state in Brazil could implement its own VAT. Different tax bases, different tax rates. But there were no coordination among the states. And the states were competing against one another, allowing companies to claim that I register in this state, but actually selling goods and services in the other. When I say I register in the other state, I pay taxes in the other state. So I don't have to pay here. But actually you pay, you don't pay in any state. But the, the problem is everybody recognized that problem in Brazil but because you already implemented it and you created vested interests in different states. So now it's impossible to make reform 
some kind of unified or even some kind of a harmonized VAT system. With, so it's impossible but because you, you started off <laughs> with different VATs and created. So the experience of Brazil and to some extent also the experience in India show that so VAT has to be national. Right? It's so not advisable for different regional or state governments to have their own VATs. But the only exception is Canada. So Canada has a dual VAT system. So in the Canada federal system, now they still have, so Canada has a federal VAT of 5%. Most provinces have their own sales tax, but they are harmonized, meaning included in the federal VAT. So some provinces, they have their own sales tax of 7% to 8%, adding to the federal government. So meaning that it's one, the federal government collect taxes, 14 to 15%. 5% goes to the federal government. Depending on provinces, some get, some has 7%, some 8%. And in terms of allocation, the options that Professor Rosinger talked about, that's the example of tax sharing or tax base sharing. They all share the tax base. But the federal get 5%, provinces get 8% or 7%. Or something. Except for Quebec, that. right? It's the French-speaking province in Canada. They want as much independence as possible from the Canadian federal government. So they still maintain their own VAT. And actually, they demand that they are the one to collect both the federal VAT and their own VAT. And they will give the federal government back 5%. So the federal government gets... So Quebec province collects both its own VAT and the federal government VAT. And then gives back the government 5%. And Quebec own VAT is 9.35%. What, how is it different from other provinces? So the other is, is the federal government collects the taxes. Including the provincial yeah. tax. Yeah. So in Quebec, it's like Quebec, they, they have their own system. So it's the Co Quebec Tax Authority. Oh, okay. So but this is the exception. So they, this Canada can do that because basically it's the capacity of the tax administration and also provinces in Canada trust one another, right? So they have a system of coordination to make sure that taxes are shared. So that's why it's the experience of China and Vietnam is that for VAT, so that's the case of Vietnam also. So Vietnam implemented the VAT in 1999 and in 2002 apply a sharing mechanism for central government and local governments in terms of VAT and other taxes. So in Vietnam, VAT, corporate income tax, personal income tax, excise tax are all collected by the general department of taxation at the central level. But the taxes are then sh shared between the central government and provinces and cities. So for China, it's uniform. Central government gets 70%, 75% of VAT and provinces, 25% for every province and cities. Central, we call the term centrally governed cities. But for Vietnam, because Vietnam, look at China and say this is not fair for poor provinces. So provinces keep more, rich provinces keep less. And sometimes provinces near the capital can lobby better, can keep more, and provinces far away from the capital can only keep less. But, uh, but we'll talk more about that on Friday when we talk about intergovernmental transfers. But at least, the good thing is that the moment you have the VAT becomes an important source, and then you have a sharing ratio. So to make also local governments happy. And again, that at least some richer provinces now can be more fiscally autonomous. They have, and the ratios are, keep, are kept stable. 
for at least five years. So they know what they will get from VAT and the income uh, taxes. So they don't have their own power to apply the tax, but they have a stable sharing ratio.